everyone, and welcome back to The Pew. I am your host, John Edwards, and I am so glad to have you here for this bonus episode of Just a Guy in the Pew. If you've been keeping up with what we've been doing lately, you know we've had these extra bonus episodes where we're bringing on some of our favorite Catholic presenters and speakers and priests and, and even a bishop here recently, and today is no different. We have the distinct honor of having Father Donald Calloway with us today as our guest. It, it, you probably know and you probably heard, I mean, unless you've been under a rock, it's the year of St. Joseph, and he has written a wonderful book called The Consecration to St. Joseph. And so we're going to have him on our guest in here, here in a few minutes, but first I want to tell you a little bit about him. Um, Father Donald was ordained in 2003. He is a member of the Congregation of the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary. He loves to surf. And as I said before, he is the author of The Consecration of St. Joseph. And he also has authored very uh, a few other books along the way as well. But today we're going to be talking about the consecration of St. Joseph. And without further ado, I want to bring up my friend, Father Donald Calloway. Hey, Father, how are you? Hey, brother. Good to be with you, man. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy. This is this is the, the year you've been working for and, and working hard for. And I'm just glad to have you on here, especially, you know, the day before uh, the, the feast day of St. Joseph. So thank you for joining us. Oh, yeah. No, I'm honored to do it, man. It's like uh, I almost feel like I'm bilocating, you know, I. I don't have that gift like the saints did, but through modern technology, sometimes people tell me, Father, I saw you three times today on media with the pre-recorded things, and I'm like, you did? <laughs> so. there you go. Well, right now, I'm sure you're busy. I'm sure, especially as we're getting closer to the to the feast day, you're just getting all kind of interview asked. So again, thank you for taking the time. I wanted to start off, you know, this year St. Joseph seemed to come out of nowhere all of a sudden. Now, probably not to some, but for your average Catholic, all of a sudden they announce, well, you know, this is the year of St. Joseph. But knowing you and, and following some of the things you've been doing, I know there was a lot more than just the Pope deciding one day to uh, to make this the year of St. Joseph here in 2021. So how instrumental were you in that, and, and how did all this come about? Yeah, so it's exciting, man. So, um, you know, I when I was putting the book together... I discovered that we've never had a year of St. Joseph for the entire church. So I was like, man, we need to do this. You know, this would be huge. And so I wrote a letter to the Pope in uh, May of 2019. Mm. And it was in English, but the Pope doesn't know English, really. And so I had a friend, a priest in Argentina, translated into Spanish. And, and he said to me, Father, a bishop who's a friend of mine from Argentina, he's in Rome right now. What if we send this to him like electronically right now? Maybe he'll be willing to give it to the Pope uh, the next day when they meet face to face. So I thought, heck wow. yeah, let's do it. You know. <laughs> so the bishop agreed. And so on May 2nd, 2019, um, this bishop, Hector Zordon from Argentina, gave the Pope my letter. And we have pictures of it. They're talking about the letter. And so then the next year, um, I started asking, because I didn't hear anything initially, I started mm. asking bishops in the United States to declare a year of St. Joseph for their diocese. And I had 12 who had done it up to that mm. point. But then, as you said, December 8th, the whole world woke up and heard that Saint, <laughs> or Pope Francis had declared a year of St. Joseph. And we were just like, it, it happened. It, it worked. You know? So, I mean, it's the Holy Spirit who did it. You know, it's, it's sure. really not my letter. But I think uh, I know he got the letter. I know he knew about it. So, um I'm stoked, man. I'm so happy about this. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people are, you know, my, my parish has been going through it. I know several here in the diocese of Memphis where I'm located have been doing it in groups at the parishes as, as many people as you can have in person, you know, with all the COVID yeah. stuff still going on, but it's just, it's blowing up everywhere. And, you know, I went through it last year and found it so helpful and so useful um, and just enjoyed it. And I know so many people have told me that they're learning so much about St. Joseph. And it really is funny. It's, you know, a guy that's never said anything in the Bible. Where do you, how do you, how do you make a book this thick about a guy that never says anything, right? I, I how did you come up know. with all this? No, it, it's a good point. People have asked me that. They're like, Father, you just, you just making this stuff up. How'd you do this? And, <laughs> Well, I mean, it is true. He's the best supporting actor in Christianity, right? He doesn't even have a single right. word, you know. But yeah. without him, things don't get done. I mean, Jesus and Mary sure. relied upon him. And so if you look at what we have in Catholicism, right, we, we believe that divine revelation comes to us in three ways. Scripture is the first and primary source for sure. But mm -hmm. then we also have sacred tradition. Uh, so we have sacred scripture. We have sacred tradition. Um, and then we have the teaching magisterium of the church. So that's a threefold source of divine revelation. 
So in scripture, we don't have much. We have his actions. But through tradition and the teaching of the church, you know, we have what popes have written, what saints have said, what shrines have been devoted to him, what miracles have taken place, what apparitions he's appeared in, and not weird stuff. I mean, approved stuff by the church. Uh, when you add all that up, you get a pretty good idea. And then if we just use our brain, right, um, yeah. thinking about all that was required of him, how much he had to walk, the labor, the hardships, the difficulties, yeah. the poverty. I mean, you can you can put it together and get a pretty I good idea of who he, who he was. Yeah. Well, I mean, why now, though? Like, I know... I know there's a lot of people that are always saying we need this from the church now or we need that. Why did you feel right now that we need St. Joseph? I mean, I know it's if you live in America, it's pretty obvious right now. Yeah. There's, a, there's, yeah. there's a lot of stuff going on with the family and the attack on the family mm -hmm. and just morals going out the window and all this stuff. Yeah. What was the reason for St. Joseph and, and why now? Why the book? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you pr pretty much said it. It's Basically, because right now we have got a crisis in just about everything. I mean, everything is in crisis mode at the moment, whether it's marriage, family, society, yeah. politics, culture. And, and there's so much of a cancel culture that wants to tear down, you know, the things that um, have held things up. And so yeah. now would be a good time when the house of the world and even in the church and in families is in disarray and disorder. It takes a good father to restore order in a chaotic household. And what better father than the head of the Holy Family, the man who was the shadow of the Heavenly Father, the man that the Messiah modeled himself on in his manhood mm. as he grew up, um, St. Joseph. So there's never been a better time to, to go to St. Joseph than right now. Sure. Well, can you expound on what you just said a second ago? Because I was watching your talk from the Virtual Catholic Conference, from the Men's Conference, and, uh, and you spoke about what you just said a little bit about how we should be able to see St. Joseph reflected in Christ when we look mm -hmm. at him. Could you expound on that a little bit? I mean, because you kind of went yeah. there in, in one of those yeah. sentences a second ago. I'd love to hear just some thoughts on that. It's profound, man. And this is what I mean by, okay, it's, it's in the scriptures, but you have to unpack it. So, for example, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, um, that episode where um, they lost Jesus uh, for three mm -hmm. days, and, and then they found him in the temple— well, it says after that, that Jesus went to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them and increased in wisdom and stature before God and man. Now, he doesn't increase in his divinity as a divine person. He's God. But in his human growth and development, which he humbly took on, he does increase. And he did that under the watchful care of the increaser. Now, what I mean by that is Joseph's name, literally, etymologically, means increase. So St. Mm -hmm. Joseph is the increaser. And here's something profound about that relationship between this particular father and son, Joseph and Jesus. When we look at Jesus's face, right? And I guarantee you, when we see him in heaven, we are going to see similar facial characteristics that he has with the Virgin Mary because they're biologically linked, right? Just mm -hmm. like I look like my mother, you look like your mother. We have facial similarities, whether it's cheekbones, eye sockets, your chin, whatever, right? Sure. Well, Jesus doesn't look like Joseph biologically because Joseph's not his biological father. However, he does look like him in the way that he acts, in his mannerisms. Mm. So this is profound because remember, on one occasion, the apostles say to Jesus, show us the Father, and talking about the Heavenly Father. And Jesus sure. says, what do you mean, show us the Father? He says, in seeing me, you have seen the Father. And they must have been like scratching their heads like, huh, wait, what? <laughs> well... Then he clarifies it, clarifies it, and he says, I can only do and say what I see the Father doing and saying. Now, that was in reference to his heavenly Father. The same is true about Joseph. I guarantee you that when you see Jesus, you're seeing Joseph because Jesus has the mannerisms, the accent, the way of walking, talking, mm -hmm. swinging an axe, all those things, because he learned him from his earthly father, St. Joseph. And that's, you know, you know the axiom, like father, like son. Well, it's yeah. true, even for the God-man who imitated Joseph. That is so profound. Yeah, it is. It is. And it really is a reminder as to fathers, for us as fathers today, the role that we play in our own children's lives. You know, you can, you can get caught up in your smartphone for hours. You can work, you know, 20 hours a day and forget that, you know, well, I'm putting food on the table. I'm, I'm providing clothes. There's a home. 
but we're supposed to be more than that, that we're supposed to be these spiritual leaders of our family. And, and really, as you're saying, teach our children things like virtue and holiness and all of these things that we should be practicing in our own life. How does, how does a man look at St. Joseph and start to emulate virtue when so many of our men today are caught up in vice? I mean, you and I both have had, yeah. have, yeah. have, have had our troubles with addictions in the past and vice. What do you have to say mm-hmm. to that? Yeah. So again, I mean, if we look to him, we what do we see in him? We see um, a hard worker for sure, right? I mean, this guy labored um, by the sweat of his brow in difficult situations sometimes. I mean, in a foreign country where he didn't know the language, how is he going to find employment? How is he going to pay the bills, so to speak? But he got the job done and he did it. And that is, he wasn't a sloucher. He wasn't, you know, a freeloader. He made a living for his family and it was hard. Um, he was also a servant. I mean, you think about all that he did to comfort his wife, to be the protector, the provider for her. And I can tell you right now, okay, if you're walking, for example, from the Holy Land to Egypt, you're not tiptoeing through the tulips, brother. That is a <laughs> difficult journey, man. Sure. And there's going to be robbers and bandits and all kind of threats against your young, beautiful bride, right? And wh- what's he going to do? Just lay down and be a victim? No. Right. We don't know the stories of the hidden life, but I guarantee you, had it come to it, St. Joseph is not just going to sit there and dialogue about it. He's going to defend his woman. Right. Sure. So that's just using common sense in your brain. A lot of times we don't think that because it's not written in the scriptures, but they were real people. And this was a real man, you know. And so yeah. I love to just meditate upon that kind of stuff. And us men need to imitate that. Even, even like me, I don't have a wife per se. Right. I'm not married to a woman. But I'm called to defend the church and to fight off the wolves and the spiritual dragons who want to, you know, destroy her and mar her beauty. That's me. And in that, I'm also imitating St. Joseph. Yeah. Well, you're, yeah, you're exactly right. And I know that that's something that we need to be doing, um, not only as father, but fathers, but also as priests. I know you talked a little bit on something I was watching, too, about what St. Joseph should mean to priest and the, the fatherly... Um, love and, and the the lessons they can learn on being a a father of, of, a, of a parish family or or um, of the flock. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, one of the big things is, again, you've got to be available, right? If, mm-hmm. if you're just off doing your own thing and you're not there, I mean, it's cliched words, but, you know, quality time, right? You, you've sure. got to be available and, and you've got to be identifiable. You know, a lot of priests today, they don't even want to look like a priest. They don't want to wear a Roman collar. They just want to wear a polo shirt and be called Larry or something. You know, it's like, <laughs> bro, you're not just Larry, right? Yeah. You're, you're in persona Christi. You're in the person of Christ and modeling, you know, fatherhood. And and Joseph was available. I mean, he wasn't a workaholic. And that, sadly, is what a lot of men do today, right? They they mm-hmm. just spend so much time at work. And, and they don't recreate. They don't spend time with their family. And they don't even sleep. St. Joseph loved to sleep, right? He talked to God in his sleep. I mean, sleep is a good thing, bro. And today, so many people are just go, 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 go. And they, they don't even take care of themselves. We got, I mean, St. Joseph took care of himself. You know what I yeah. mean? It's good. Yeah. You're right. And, and you know, and we, there can be so much learned from the fact that he didn't leave, right? He didn't leave Mary when things got tough. Mm. Um, that's mm. something else that I think is a great lesson for men today is, is, you know, you see around the country now, you see so many families without fathers. You see women with lots of children from different fathers or just yeah. different situations around. And one of the things that I always admired, and, and you're, you're so right about, there isn't something where Joseph says, you know, I did this, 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 and this. But if you're looking past just the words on the page at the actions of what are actually going on in Scripture and what he's doing, you know, mm-hmm. I, that's one of my favorite things to do when I'm reading scripture period is like with Christ, what is he, what virtue is he portraying in scripture? What is he doing in this moment? You know, how is he interacting with people? And we see that with St. Joseph, you know, in the fact that he didn't leave Mary. Can you talk about that in a way about what yeah. that must have been like for him and, and what that must mean yeah. for us in difficult times? Yeah, no, this is huge. And that's a there's a big part in the book that deals with this particular thing, because sometimes and with what with good intentions, for sure, people have interpreted that event when he discovers that his wife is pregnant, you know, sure, um, that he was like, I'm out of here, like you cheated on me. And I'm like, really? I'm like, (laughs) 
he wouldn't have thought that. I mean, sure. he wasn't dumb. I mean, he knew the scriptures. He was a devout Jew. He knew that there was a prophecy from a guy named Isaiah that said the virgin shall be with child. He wasn't ignorant, right? So he would have been like, oh, wait a minute. Are, it's you? Oh, I can't do this. Who am I? I'm just like a little carpenter, man. I can't take care of what's going on here. You're, you're, you're the one. And, and what is inside you is such a mystery that, you know, he was in all of this. And so he wanted to back away from her, not out of thinking that she had done something wrong, but he was aware of his unworthiness. And so mm. he, he basically knew I'm in the presence of, you know, the tabernacle presence here, the Ark of the Covenant. Um, I'm not worthy. And yet, you know, he didn't abandon her. He was taking all of this to prayer, again, in his sleep, right? The man yeah, prayed sure. even when he slept. And then God <laughs> sent the angel to him to tell him, do not be afraid. Say, he was afraid because he was in the presence of the ark. He was in the presence of that burning fire, you know, like, mm. like Moses saw in the burning bush. He was in fear. You know? And so when the angel told him, don't be afraid to take her into your home, he rose to the challenge and he, he manned up, as we, as we say, and became the great, um, you know, provider, protector, defender of the All Holy Virgin and the Eternal Son of the Father. Wow, what yeah. a man! <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're not kidding. You're not kidding. I tell you what, the thing that always gets me about Saint Joseph, and I love that you you did this with your book. I love this depiction of of, of Saint Joseph. Because a lot of times you look around and you see this sort of frail, old, he looks like he's 120, you know, and he's got this, you know, 14 or 15 year old, you know, wife with him. Right. And I love that you've depicted him in this sort of manly, youthful way. Mm. Why do you, why did you pick that sort of image and what should that tell us about St. Joseph? Yeah, I, I hear you, man. Cause I was like, I mean, I always thought that it was the teaching of the church that he was old, like grandpa, you know, and just kind of some dude sure. in the background who wasn't even attractive. He was pretty, you know, just insignificant. And sometimes even the images that I saw, he looked soft and effeminate even. And I'm like, yeah, what's up with that? And I'm like, and then I discovered in my research, the Catholic church has never taught that he was an old man. That, that, wow. that was only it comes from legends to try and protect the virginity of marriage so that people wouldn't think, oh, okay. well, he was young and, you know, no. It actually takes a young man, when you're living with the most beautiful woman ever, um, yeah. to have a very chaste heart. And so when you show St. Joseph is old, you're basically saying that young man, men can't be chaste. And that's not wow. true, right? Yeah. So, and what's amazing about a younger presentation of him is that it shows that this guy modeled manhood for the Messiah. Um, mm -hmm. So again, Jesus' eyes as his son every day would have been looking at him at how he's treating others, how he's a just man in his job, how he's, you know, uh, a prayerful man, all those things. And nothing wrong with old men, of course. I don't want people to think that. Uh, absolutely not. Sure. But uh, you, you have to acknowledge that old men, they can't model manhood. Sorry about that. This hopefully won't happen all during the interview. No, it's um, okay. Yeah, it's just my life right now, man. It's my everything's like a slot machine. Every day I'll get in contact. Um, that's fine. What would he observe in an old man? You know, afternoon naps and forgetfulness. I mean, that's what happens to us when we grow old. I'm starting to happen to me already. You know, I was like, yeah, there you um, go. no, he would have observed a man who checked this out. I love, I love this factual stuff here. It was required of Jewish men at that time, according to the Old Testament, to go to Jerusalem three times a year to fulfill certain rituals. Three-day walk from Nazareth, one way, so six days, basically. If you had to do that three times a year, let's just say for 30 years, do the math. St. Joseph walked three-fourths of the way around the planet. Oh, my right? gosh. That's yeah. the facts, man. That's the, I'm yeah. not making Father Calloway's not fudging this. That's the facts. So sure. uh, that requires strength, vitality, and, 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 and not an old man. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's that's a that's a tremendous point when you think about that and put it into yeah. that kind of detail that he had to be a guy that was in good health, that was in good shape to be able to do those things on those long tracks. Yep. But the yep. other impressive thing is, as you pointed to this a minute ago too, is this young, most beautiful woman in the world, and he was able to master his passions, right? And how many of us today, men, aren't able to do that same thing? I mean, what a lesson to be able to learn from him and, and just the virtues of, as you said, chastity. And the one that really sticks out to me with him is humility, right? To be yeah. able to say, 
I, I have this wife. I have this this whole plan of life that I have in my head that things are going to go this way. We're going to have you know two point three children, and they're all going to be carpenters and whatever else. And then all of a sudden, God shows up and says, "No, it's going to be my kid, right? And and, and you're going to just be the dad, right? And that He accepted that, right? That He mm. they accepted that humility. Gosh, yeah. what a profound thought! Can you talk about that for just a minute? Yeah, just both of those of things. Yeah, yeah, both of those, the purity and the humility, are so crucial. Um, that these are real things that men need to imitate today because, you know, today we live in such a fleshly world where, you know, pornographic images are put in our faces almost every day. You don't have, yeah. you don't have to be clicking a mouse in the privacy of your room. It'll find you when you're just watching TV or on a billboard or on the side of a bus, you know, soft versions that, you know, get the mind rolling and went sure. for a man, right? It's what we see and we start thinking about other things. Well, this pornographic age in which we live, we need men to be pure because when they're pure, they can see God, right? So mm. Jesus said, the pure of heart shall see God. If you don't have a pure heart, you're blind spiritually, and you're spiritually impotent as well. And the devil ain't worried about you. But if you're pure, you're powerful. And if you're humble, right? St. Joseph didn't get a trophy for what he did. Everybody today wants a trophy and a merit badge and wants to be acknowledged for everything that they do, right? Sometimes I go to these events, and you know, at the beginning or the end of the event, you got to, you know, acknowledge every Tom, Dick and Harry in the room and get the, the acknowledgements take 20 minutes. I'm like, yeah. they're just doing their job. Why has everybody got to get a trophy, you know, and everything? Sure. sure, we're grateful, but this is ridiculous, you know, yeah. just, you know, you know, be done with it already, you know. So if you look at St. Joseph, I mean, he, he didn't get acknowledged for anything. And yet it was that humility that mm. he was called to be the head of the Holy Family. And, yeah. bro, that's so extraordinary because here you have in the Holy Family, Jesus, who's God. You have Mary, who's not God, but the perfect creature. Mm. And yet, whose role was it to lead the prayers of the family? Joseph's. Joseph's it wasn't yeah. Jesus's, and he could have done it way better. Jesus, Our Lady could have sure. done it a lot better. But Joseph, it was hit up to him to do it. That humility of even in the presence of God and a perfect creature, um, you acknowledge you're not worthy, and yet you know your place, your role, and you lead with humility. That's, boy, we need that in men today. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Well, I want to get into talking about the book here for a few minutes. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you is how long did it take you? Because I, like I said, I've gone through this. I'm looking at it. I mean, it's, it's a very, try to get the screen here. There's, it's a very, you know, thick book. There's tons of prayers in it. I mean, it, when I, when I went through it, I remember, I, I remember feeling like, gosh, I could just dive into this for like months and months and mm. months and go through it again. And, and all these facts, like, I remember thinking, gosh, how much of his life did he give to putting this together? Because it's so right. amazing and it's so factual and so um, just informative. Like, how long did it take you to put all this together? Uh, three years. So, wow. yeah. And I'm so grateful that I was able to do it before the whole shutdown of the world, you know, with the coronavirus sure. stuff. Because I, I did. I did research in libraries in Croatia, Poland, South America, you name it. Wow. And um translations, first time things have ever appeared in English from certain languages. And yeah, it was a lot of work. I'm not going to lie. It wasn't easy. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> but it was worth it, man, because now it's like global. The world's just eating it up. So souls are being so touched and that yeah. that's everything, man. That's that's what it's all about. So you didn't get to surf much during those three years. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. But it is funny. Like, there were some times when, you know, you just have down days and I'm in some sure. other place and people know I surf. So like, Father, so-and-so has a wetsuit at the parish and they've got a board that probably you could ride. And I'm like, sweet, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask you one question. And I promise we'll go back to St. Joseph. But I, I know a lot of people who surf and they ask me if I would ever want to. And I say no strictly because of great white sharks. I don't want to be in the water anywhere around. Right, there. right. Does that not yeah. freak you out being in the water with a, something that's like as big as a bus? Yeah, and something can eat you. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Totally. I mean, <laughs> sometimes it's not on your mind, but then once you start to think about it in the water, it can almost paralyze you. You don't want to think sure. about it too much, you know, because you can't see what's below you. But I actually, for the first time in my life, and I've been surfing since I was like 10, um, sure. it was about half a year ago, I saw my first great white shark in the water. I was in the water. Wow. And I was like 100 feet plus offshore, and there was probably about an eight footer. Um, swimming, oh. just cruising by slow, I'd say at a, you know, I don't know, maybe it was about 35, 40 feet away from me. Um, 
Yeah, I thought I was going to be able to walk on water at that That's point, brother. I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I turned towards the shore and I was boogieing, man. I was moving. That's, so, yeah. that's what I was going to ask. Did you learn to walk on water? But, <laughs> but anyway, back to the book. I want to ask you because I mean, another book that a lot of people have done, and, and a lot of consecrations. Obviously, tons and thousands of people around the world have done the Saint Louis mm-hmm. de Montfort's consecration to Mary. What kind of mm-hmm. role did that play as you were kind of? getting your idea and putting this together, whiteboarding it, whatever you want to call it. What role yeah. did it play in putting together this consecration of St. Joseph? That's a great point. Um, because when I gathered all that information that I had and I had so much, I didn't know what to really do with it. Like, how do I put this in a format that's, that's people are going to enjoy and get a lot out of. So I was praying about that and I really struggled for several months. Well, I came to the realization that, you know what, this book by St. Louis de Montfort that I myself had done when I converted to Catholicism, Mm -hmm. it's 33 days and it's really brilliantly put together. And I thought, why do I need to reinvent the wheel? I'll just imitate what he did and accept the content will be about St. Joseph. So that's how that came together. But then I didn't know what exactly, how do I put every day? Well, I was praying the litany of St. Joseph and all of a sudden one day I'm sitting in prayer and I'm like, how many titles are there anyway? So I start counting them and I'm like, holy smokes. I'm like, there's almost 33. And I'm like, perfect. If I have yeah. an introduction, go through every title and then a conclusion, nailed it. So it, it was totally <laughs> Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, that was one of my favorite parts was going through that litany and going, oh my gosh, like look at the names he has. And just so many of them I'd never heard. I mean, of course, we all have our favorite, you know, my favorite is the Terror of Demons. That's just like the coolest nickname ever for anybody. Yeah. But what? It, while we're on that, what's your favorite name for Joseph? Which one do you like the best? Bro, it's Terror of Demons, of course. That's man. what I was I mean, say. <laughs> that's like yeah. the money title, man. It's like, I mean, can you imagine like, if, if you call your dad, you know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, when, when you were threatened, you say, my dad will beat your dad up. Well, oh, my sure. dad's a terror of demons, bro. My dad's a terror of demons. You, you know, so. That's right. Again, the, hum- the point of humility, you got to be a pretty humble guy when people open the door and announce you in the room as the terror of demons. <laughs> you got to be a pretty humble totally. guy there. But, but I tell you what, so if, if people are going to start this and I know that, you know, you start on certain days to end on the feast day. Um, can they start at different times of year? What do you suggest in that if, you know, tomorrow's the feast day. So if someone hasn't started already, what do you recommend about when to start and how to go through it? Yeah. So you, you can do it anytime you want in the book and on the website, I, I, there's a chart I put together that offers suggested times, right? So, um, and I've done the work for you for the bigger ones. Like that way you don't have to count it out the 33 days. It tells you what day to start and what day it ends, but here's something cool, man. I've actually mm-hmm. heard people doing it, especially couples, that they ha- they start it so that it ends on their wedding anniversary. That way they're oh, dedicating wow. their marriage to St. Joseph. Isn't that awesome? I, I think yeah, it's brilliant. that's awesome. I mean, there's, cool. there's, pe- people, there's a lot of smart people out there, <laughs> a lot smarter than me. Right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the other thing I want to ask you about, what about groups? I know you can do this on your own, but it seems like there's a lot of groups that go through this. And then you mm-hmm. can do some of the things like have a mass when you're, you know, when you're finishing the consecration. What do you, what do you say about that to groups that want to do it? Yeah, so it can be done by individuals, which is great. But um, mm-hmm. uh, tons of groups have been doing it. And in the back of the book, um, is the group format. So there's what the leader does, there's the discussion questions, the format of how frequently you meet, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's all in one book. There's not uh, you know, auxiliary books or programs or anything. It's all in the one book. And I think more parishes are going to start doing that, and especially on site, because of course, during the craziness of the, our times, people have been doing it on Zoom or whatever, some other format. Um, which has been great. They've told me, Father, this is fantastic. We've been everybody looks like the Brady Bunch on their little screen sure. and they're doing their <laughs> yeah. little program, you know. Uh, sure. So, but eventually we're going to start doing it in person in parishes. So, yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, is there anything else you want to just you want to talk about with the book? Um, I know that you have so much information back here in the back, you know, in the addendum parts and the shrines, and you can learn so yeah. much about all this. Is there, you know? Do you recommend people going back through this and reading this sort of historical parts uh, outside of the consecration? I mean, what? Because there's just when you open this, you go like, "Gosh, again, how is there this much about this guy that I never knew existed?" Right. So, right. you know, people, what is the best way for people, even if they've gone through the consecration, for them to mm-hmm. go back in and to learn more and more about Saint Joseph in here? Yeah, pretty much like you said. I mean, you can, and I, I know people are doing that. They're saying, Father, 
it was great, but it's over. But I'm going back and I'm reading this particular section and making notes or or even, you know, you can use because I've got an intense bibliography in the back. Some people are saying, boy, those quotes from St. Peter Julian Mar were fantastic. Let me get his book. Right. He wrote a book on St. Joseph called The Month of St. Joseph. Or they're going mm-hmm. to St. Jose Maria Escriva because he's got sure. stuff or St. Francis de Sales. So it's leading to other things or there's simply, you know, because I, I have my own art in the book. But I don't. I did, wasn't able to put in a lot of things that I talk about in the book, like images of the Holy Ring, for example, sure. uh, Saint Joseph's wedding ring that he gave Our Lady. It still exists. It's in Italy. So people are like, "What's this thing look like?" So they're going to Google and they're like, "Wow, you know." Now I've got the image that Father Callaway was talking about, or the Holy House of Loretto, or that miraculous staircase yeah. in New Mexico. And there, I've even heard people saying. Once all this craziness of the coronavirus stuff is over, I'm making a pilgrimage to Italy to go see the Holy House, you know, and stuff like that. So pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, one, I want to ask you one final question because I know your time's valuable and you've probably got a lot of other people that are wanting your time too. Um, what situations in our life, as men and women, we have mostly men that listen to the show, but a lot of the women watch the video uh, episodes. At what point or, or what sort of situations in our life should we really call upon St. Joseph? Because you hear, you know, of course you call on Christ in all things. And then, of yeah. course, we're led to, to call on the Blessed Mother, too. In your opinion, what are some of the some of the times that we should look at as men and even women uh, to call on uh, St. Joseph for, for his intercession? Yeah, I would definitely say when it comes to everybody struggle when it comes to matters of purity you know, mm-hmm. some some are stronger at it than others. But in this time, there's a lot of weaknesses with it. So ask sure. him, because that's one of the privileges of devotion to St. Joseph. In the book, mm-hmm. there's this uh, mystic, Venerable Mary of Agreda, 16th century. But she wrote down certain privileges that people get when they're devoted to St. Joseph. And number one is purity, according to your state yeah. in life. And so, and I can tell you, I mean, it works, man. I mean, I'm a dude. I'm not a robot. I'm not an angel, right? I got eyes. I see things. And God's made a beautiful creation, right? So I'm like, Lord, l- l- give me some purity, you know? And, and <laughs> St. Joseph, when I call upon him, he delivers, man. He delivers. Yeah. He helps me with that. And then also I would say, you know, right now, there's a lot of anxiety in the world, a lot of stress, a lot of fear. Sure. And many people have lost their jobs or things. And um, he's he's a source of hope for us. He's a source of peace because he helps us to put things in perspective and realize that God is still with us. You know, we're, 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 we haven't been abandoned, even though the times are tough. Um, and he's really coming through on that for so many people. They've told me, look, Father, 2020, my world fell apart. But this consecration program helped me to keep things together. It gave me sure. peace and hope. And I'm like, awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, that's so true. I mean, you could one could say that St. Joseph's world was turned upside down that night in that dream, too. And, and he is definitely a model of how to continue and follow in the footsteps of the Lord, even in difficult times. So what a great point. And, and you know, I want to I want to end there, but I want to give you an opportunity to tell people where can they get this? Uh, give me the website, anything you're yeah. doing that's promoting it or podcast yeah. or anything like that you got going on. Yeah, so we designed a website specifically for it, where you can get the book, and it's you can get the ebook, the audio book. It's in Spanish. Um, it's in actually about fifteen languages right now, but in the states, just English is in Spanish. Um, sure. But the website is the title of the book, so it's consecration to Saint Joseph dot org, and don't spell mm-hmm. out Saint. It's not spell. It's just S T. So consecration to Saint Joseph dot org, and it's also there that you'll, you'll find out about the commissioned artwork that I did, where St. Joseph is young, oh, wow. strong, is awesome, holding an ax, you know? And yeah. then also <laughs> the the rosary I designed, which is epic. Okay. It's called the St. Joseph Terror of Demons Rosary. And I designed it myself. They're made in Italy, and they're awesome. So they're, they're on that website as well. I'll have to check that out. I'd love to get one of those. So, But yeah, everyone go there. Get this book, you know, go through the consecration of St. Joseph. So many of us have gone through the consecration of Mary. Now it's time to get the other half of the Holy Family, right? The other half of, <laughs> of, of Jesus's, uh, you know, family there. So, Father, again, thank you. If you're uh, someone that's watching this and you are a patron of the show, somebody who supports the ministry, this is not going to be the end. Father and I are going to jump on another short interview for men. We're going to be talking about, you know, things that men should look for and model in St. Joseph. So you can find that. And 
and you can hear that other episode or that other interview by going to justaguyonthepew.com and going to support the ministry there, and you'll be able to become a patron and, and to hear that other interview as long as, as well as all the other extras that we've done as well. But so you can go to that. Father, we have enjoyed this main interview. Thank you so much for not just being here, but for everything you've done for the church. Uh, what a blessing you are, and, and, uh, and you continue to be to all of us. Thanks, brother. God bless you too, man. Keep up the good work. All right. See you soon.